Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank John Squared for uh, inviting me here to uh, give this presentation and also the Academy for uh, taking on this, this very difficult topic. I think it's uh, extremely important and something I've been working on for 20 years now. Um, and uh, there, there definitely needs to be uh, more attention on it. So, uh, as John said, I'll be talking about AMR, more of a focus on humans today. Uh, conflicts of interest, uh, I don't have any. Um, and so the objectives of my presentation are really to uh, set you up on what we're doing currently to uh, the systems that are in place to, to monitor antimicrobial resistance on the human side at a national level, and then try to highlight some of the issues, AMR issues, around some of the gram positive and negatives uh, that we're doing surveillance on, and, and look at uh, just some of the, the gaps um, or areas that uh, we could potentially build on um, for uh, uh, new surveillance initiatives. Uh, I think FAC uh, does a very good job at uh, the surveillance programs that, that are uh, ongoing right now, and we produce a, a lot of annual reports that um, are, are shown along the bottom here. These are all on, on the web, um, if you just go to uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada website and search AMR, you'll be able to find all these highly detailed reports. As well, um, uh, that was mentioned earlier, a couple of years ago, the uh, CARS program uh, came into being. And so what CARS has done is um, took all of this information from, from all of these different areas on focused on AMR and tried to synthesize them or, or um, funnel them down into something uh, a little bit more abbreviated and trying to link some of these things together. So like uh, other countries, we've, uh, we've put out our list of uh, top priority organisms and I just want to highlight from a, from a lab perspective, um, the, my, my team at the, at the NML is responsible for all of these organisms on the list with the exception of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is, is done by another group. So I'm, I'm in a very unique position where I get to see a lot of the emerging AMR issues that are occurring from uh, numerous different surveillance programs. And I should also uh, say at, that the lab not only provides input into the existing national surveillance programs that are going on uh, in the federal government, but we also uh, provide reference services for the provincial public health labs and the hospitals to help confirm some of the antibiotic resistant organisms and help during outbreaks of, of some of these organisms in our, in our hospital systems. Um, the other thing I'd also like to mention too that uh, just recently, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, the laboratories for food and animal AMR have been moved under my area as well. So from a lab perspective, we, we have sort of a, a One Health look at, at uh, some of the surveillance that's going on. So getting into some of the, the data right now, um, and I'll start off with Neisseria gonorrhea in Canada. And so you can see that um, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the drugs we're using are, are uh, the resistance is increasing over time, and the main drug uh, in the past was ciprofloxacin in green here. Uh, that was the, the frontline drug that was used to treat a lot of Neisseria gonorrhea infections, and um, uh, that, was, that was good until about 2004 to 2006 when we began to see um, an, in, an increase, and generally speaking, once uh, once resistance gets above five percent, it's usually not recommended anymore for for use as a, a frontline agent to to treat Neisseria gonorrhea. So the uh, the the guidelines changed when they began to to see this this increase in ciprofloxacin, and they changed it to Cefixime, a third generation cephalosporin, and so. 
uh, suffixeme is, is shown in, in the orange line here, another third generation cephalosporin is ceftriaxone. So you can see when the guidelines changed, we began to see an increase in the cephalosporin resistance occurring. And so again, this uh, brought about another change in the treatment guidelines in Canada. Um, and now it's, it's been changed to dual therapy both a cephalosporin and azithromycin, and you could see that the change in guidelines has had a, a positive effect in a decrease in some of the resistance that we're seeing to cephalosporins, but in red here is the azithromycin resistance, and that's starting to creep up, which is a, of concern. I think the other thing I want to highlight uh, here is that um, we, we do see in a lot of the other antimicrobials that can no longer be used because of the high resistance rates, I think the, the importance of point-of-care diagnostics, rapid diagnostics to identify some of the resistance markers is extremely important because if we can fairly rapidly identify which strains are Cipro resistant, let's say, uh, even though 30% of the isolates are resistant, that means 70% are susceptible and still could be used. But the big challenge is getting the rapid point of care so that the physician could make the decision right in the office for prescribing purposes. So, uh, you know, the new diagnostics coming out may open up some of the old drugs that were no longer of use because of the elevated resistance rates. Um, as well, we can see for Neisseria gonorrhea, this is just the, uh, uh, the total number of cases in Canada since uh, 2000, and you can see that it's it's gone up from about 6,000 cases in the year 2000 to uh, almost 20,000 in uh, 2015. And the other highlight I want to show on this slide: this the gray part of the bars represent uh, diagnosis of Neisseria gonorrhea by nucleic acid-based methods. So there's no organism to test. So we're only testing about 25% of uh, the isolates because that's all we have. All the rest is molecular. But uh, on a positive side, I'm really uh, um, encouraged by some of the work that, that we've been doing at the National Micro Lab. We've developed real-time PCR assays and uh, have published and validated these assays to be able to use them on gnats. And we can also take a gnat specimen that, that's been used by uh, the clinical lab. They can just send us that spent specimen, uh, gnat specimen, and we could actually perform a typing on them and uh, predict the antimicrobial uh, resistance in some of those samples. So it's opening up a whole potentially new area of surveillance without an organism. And this is extremely important for the, the north where um, it's very difficult to actually get, because of the time it takes to transport Neisseria gonorrhea, it's usually dead by the time it gets to a clinical lab. So we can take those nucleic acid tests and we're working with Northwest Territories, we're working with uh, First Nations uh, uh, right now to um, help them improve their surveillance just through these nucleic acid-based tests. Uh, another surveillance uh, program that's underway is called Can Ward, and this is run out of the University of Manitoba. It's, it's not a Public Health Agency of Canada program, but it is a hospital-based surveillance that's funded by uh, grants and, uh, and through drug companies. But we, we work with them closely and uh, provide some support. And so this, this surveillance program, oops, uh, how do I go back? This surveillance program looks at um, in, infections. So they ask for the first 100 bloodstream isolates, 100 respiratory, urine, wound, etc. Doesn't matter what the organism is, doesn't matter what the susceptibility. They all get sent to uh, uh, University of Manitoba under Drs. George Zanell and uh, Daryl Holbin and they perform susceptibility tests on them. So it gives us an idea of some of the percentages of, of resistance. Uh, this is uh, the, the total number, uh, uh, yeah, the percentage of bloodstream infections, the, the, the organisms that are causing bloodstream infections. And uh, you can see that uh, some of the gram negatives, the E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Pseudomonas, Enterobacter, make up uh, about 35% of, of all the organisms. And, uh, and these are really the organisms I'm most concerned about and they're on the top priority lists because we're, we're, uh, we don't have the, uh, we're running out of the antimicrobials to treat 
these types of infections. And then you've all, all also heard um, about the Canadian Nosocomial Infection Surveillance Program earlier today. And again, this is one of the flagship programs within the agency. It was formed in uh, 1995, and I actually joined the Public Health or the Health Canada at the time uh, in 96 to set up a lab to pr provide support for it. But it's a collaboration um, between uh, the Canadian Hospital Epidemiology Committee, which is a subcommittee of AMI Canada, and the epidemiologists uh, in Ottawa, as well as uh, our group at the National Microbiology Lab. And it, it covers 65 hospitals, uh, and it involves uh, also pediatric hospitals, so we can do sp uh, specific studies on, on pediatric AMR. This is a summary of the surveillance that has uh, gone on at, at the CNIS program over time. Uh, MRSA was brought on uh, as the first organism and then we slowly built it over time by adding, adding organisms. And so um, you can see that uh, the rates of MRSA here have steadily increased till about 2010-11 where they dropped and then leveled off again. C. difficile is a uh, somewhat of a good story, as you can see, the the rates are uh, are are decreasing for C. difficile. VRE uh, it has uh, begun to increase between about 2007 to 2012, uh, and then has uh, leveled off. And then the red line here is the carbapenemase producing organisms, and so you can see right now that it's an emerging issue. But from from the surveillance from the CNIS surveillance, the rates are still very low in those hospital sites. So what's going on with uh, uh, um, C. C. difficile infections uh, from the CNIS program? Um, so I mentioned that the, this, is the, this line represents the overall rates. And I guess what I wanted to show you on this slide is there's regional differences. So blue represents the western provinces, Manitoba westward. Uh, central is Ontario, Quebec, and uh, the green is the, the maritime provinces. And so we can see C. diff has remained, uh, the rates have remained fairly constant in the maritime provinces. And it's the west and the central areas that are really uh, driving down, down the rates overall at a national level. Um, another good story with C. difficile is a decrease in uh, uh, some of the virulent strains. So this is uh, the organisms uh, uh, C. difficile that we've typed, and they're called NAP or North American pulsotypes. NAP1 was the uh, uh, virulent strain that started in Quebec, caused large outbreaks early 2000s in Quebec. Uh, there were almost 2,000 deaths attributed to that outbreak in the early 2000s. Um, so on a positive side, we're, we're seeing a decrease in the, the numbers or the proportion of, of NAP1s, but they're being replaced by other NAP types uh, over here um, that appear so far to be less virulent than the NAP1. So that's, that's kind of good news. And the other thing I want to mention too in a lot of the surveillance we're doing is we're, we're always worried about the trends of how everything's going up. When we see things disappearing or going away, I think it's just as important to be understanding why they're going away so that hopefully we can uh, try to learn from that and, uh, and improve on it. Uh, so for, well, we heard about MRSA, so I'm going to skip that, but um, the other thing I want to mention about it, we heard a little bit about livestock MRSA or LS MRSA. That was a problem in Europe, and uh, it hasn't become a problem really in North America. I believe we've out of about 35,000 strains we've typed since 1996, we've seen about uh, 90 or so of those livestock strains. So it's not a problem. Uh, there's also a, a, a new emerging uh, MEC gene, MEC C, and we haven't seen any of those in Canada. Uh, on a positive note, we haven't seen any vancomycin resistant MRSAs as well. And daptomycin, another uh, antimicrobial used to treat these infections, is still quite low. Um, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, moving on to the gram negatives, uh, this is data from the uh, Can Ward study, and this is looking at ESBLs and E. coli as a percentage, and this is the Canadian data here. So the Can Ward program started in 2007, and uh, we had rates of uh, you know around 3% for the 
the first uh, four years, and then we've we've begun to see an increase. So we're at about uh, 12 percent, uh, 10, 12 percent for ESBLs and E. coli right now from from the hospitals under surveillance in the CAN ward, and the ESBLs in Klebsiella pneumoniae are also the same. But the the increase in the ESBLs also cause an increase in the use of the carbapenem drugs. And so when you increase the use of carbapenems, you're going to see carbapenem resistant isolates emerge or carbapenemases. And earlier I showed you the CNIS uh, carbapenemase data was very low and it was fairly static. But this is data from the provincial public health labs. Um, and what, uh, what this highlights, this is just the total number of cases that are reported up from the provincial public health labs. And the, uh, the colors just represent the genes that are responsible for the, the type of carbapenemases. And what we're seeing is about a doubling every year of uh, carbapenemases uh, producing Enterobacteriaceae being reported by our, our provinces. So it's a different story than what we see at our CNISP surveillance. And maybe that's because uh, the, the provinces are getting colonizations and infections from everywhere whereas CNISP are, are very large tertiary care teaching centers. Uh, so that might be part of a reason. And I just also want to highlight that we uh, collate the data every six months. And so um, this is the first six months of 2017. And I, I think if we continue at this rate, um, it, there may be a slight leveling off of the reports of, of CPEs from the provinces. Um, an, another emerging issue is mobile colistin resistance. And so, again, colistin is sort of the very last line of defense to treat uh, carbapenemase producing Enterobacteriaceae. And it's always been chromosomal mutations. And about a, a year and a half ago, uh, a group in China reported on uh, uh, resistance genes on a, a mobile plasmid. And this sort of started the alarm, alarm bells because once it's on a mobile plasmid, it can rapidly move between strains. Um, and so um, everybody, I guess, started uh, looking for this gene in their whole genome sequences. And uh, it, was, it was really quite interesting because this was the first time that people started screening the genomes that they had sequenced for the presence of this resistance gene. And um, very... Uh, very rapidly, people began to report finding this MCR1 gene uh, in, in their collections. And that not only were they from uh, human cases, but they were also found in food and animals as well. And so um, I've been trying to monitor all the countries that uh, have been reporting it. And so far, there's been 33 countries now reporting the, the mobile colistin resistance. Um, and so again, this is... Uh, certainly uh, uh, an emerging issue that we're concerned about. This is the Canadian picture right now, and this is data that we've uh, mined from our whole genome sequences or that we've collected through some of our reference services. So some of the provinces are looking at colistin resistance, and they'll send us isolates to confirm. So we've had seven human cases, oops, seven human cases so far uh, from uh, 10 isolates. Uh, we've also seen it as part of our CPARS program, which we're, Rebecca will be talking about uh, in a minute. Um, so it's, it's in our food and animal supplies, primarily from retail beef in the food uh, we're seeing it from. And also we've been uh, working with uh, Tom Edge from Environment Canada and Dr. Allison McGeer, who's here today as well, um, in a Toronto area sewage study and uh, we found six isolates from uh, sampling that was done in, in the Toronto sewage system uh, from back in 2012. We also found isolates that contain this mobile colistin resistance. And then finally, the, the new kid on the block is uh, that you'll be hearing more and more about is multidrug resistant Candida auris. And um, this was uh, first, first reported in uh, Korea and Japan in uh, 2009. And now we're, we're starting to see other countries reporting this uh, multi-drug resistant strain. And uh, just this May, Canada reported its first case from Manitoba uh, from uh, a patient who traveled to uh, India and, uh, and received medical attention in India. And, 
uh, possibly picked it up uh, from from India. But so this is now on our radar, and I think it's something that we need to be uh, paying attention to. So where are the surveillance gaps? Um, just a, a quick laundry list of what I thought might be some of the gaps. We, we need better community surveillance. The ESBLs are out in our community. We know the carbapenemase producers are going to be out in our community. We have to be paying attention to that. These are E. coli's are the most common cause of UTIs in the community. And if we start seeing carbapenemase producing infections, uh, there's going to be very little left to treat those types of infections. We, we need better studies on some of our marginalized populations. Um, also, uh, improve surveillance in some of the smaller hospitals, nursing homes, and, and in the north. Uh, that's certainly one of the gaps uh, for some of the AMR surveillance. Better understanding of how AMR is imported, and that's in both human and animals. Um, it's so difficult to get travel history from patients when we when we start uh, finding some of these uh, uh, human cases and also in the CPARS program, we need to be looking at uh, more improved surveillance from our imported foods. Um, improved reporting on AMR, more, I heard more rapid uh, reporting of AMR is gonna be important. And whole genome sequencing is really gonna revolutionize everything. And so we need ways of networking all of the labs that will be generating all of this sequence to be able to, to rapidly an analyze it. So I, uh, just, just to summarize, I think we have some good news. Our, some of our surveillance programs are uh, top-notch, uh, some of the best in the world, um, and we're finding that there is some good news about some of the AMR. It's, it's decreasing in, in some of the organisms. Uh, the other thing I'd just like to say is we, we got to do a better job at understanding why it's going away, too. Um, there, there continues to be more emerging threats all the time, and I don't think that's going to change. Um, and uh, I, again, whole genome sequencing is, is really going to change uh, the whole landscape of surveillance and uh, clinical diagnostic medicine uh, in the future. And so I'd just like to acknowledge the many, many, many people from the federal government and uh, universities, uh, hospitals, uh, and, and some of the basic researchers we work with uh, on a daily basis to, to try to solve these complex issues. Thank you.